Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cafe New Canadians. Cafe New Canadians is a virtual talk show that is brought to you by New Canadians TV Network. It's a space where we discuss lots of topics that will help you in your uh, in planning your life and work in Canada. Today's session is all about winning strategies to attract a Canadian job offer. I'm Shruti Dargan, your host for today, and I'm so pleased to welcome two amazing guests who will be joining us. Our speakers today are uh, Clark Glassford. He's a career and interview coach and has his firm called uh, My Practice Interview. We'll hear about that later. And also John McGraw. He's an intercultural coach and founder of Hiyaku Coaching. Again, more about that very shortly. Welcome to both of our guests. And while they join us, uh, let me tell all of you joining us today that uh, we will be taking questions from you and our experts would be answering those. So feel free to share your questions in the Q&A tab if you're joining us on Zoom. We're also live streaming this on YouTube. If you're joining us there, please use the chat box and we will get to your questions soon enough. So once again, a very warm welcome to both our guests. Um, well, both of you. Today's topic, you know, of course, uh, like I shared, is all about winning strategies to get people um, that Canadian job offer. And who better than the two of you to talk about that? Let's start with a little bit of an introduction. Clark, could I begin with you? Uh, just a little bit more about you, if you could share that. So our viewers today know, you know, what exactly your expertise is. Sure. I think uh, as always, uh, my background is uh, in human resources in Canada. So I've got over 25 years of human resource experience uh, working in uh, small organizations, large organizations, and lots of hiring uh, from positions from entry level jobs right up to senior level executive positions. Uh, so I've got a lot of experience hiring Canada, and my business, my practice interview is all about uh, assisting people in either their career goals or their job goals uh, through the interview process and helping them prepare for job interviews, prepare for interviews so that they're landing uh, the, the job that they want. And, uh, and and that's where my coaching business comes in. Fantastic. And today, of course, we'll be talking about the preliminary work for that, you know, before the interview, what all can one do to be able to land that interview and then excel at that. Um, John, could I hear from you just a little bit more? And uh, you, I know, specifically also work with newcomers and immigrants. So if you could tell us a little bit about that as well. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Shruti. And it's a pleasure to be here uh, for the first time here on Cafe New Canadians. So I help newcomers and expats connect across cultures to be successful in less time and pain. So I'm an intercultural coach. And the reason that my name, a uh, company name Hyaku Coaching, which is a little bit tricky to pronounce, is that it is because it's Japanese for a great leap or progress. And the reason that I have a Japanese name is because although I was born I was born and raised in Canada. I have the experience of adjusting to life in another culture. I lived in Japan for several years uh, where I actually started. Most of my background is in ESL, but I transitioned into helping with cultural adjustments because I realized that language was only one aspect. And in fact, there there are so many other things that are affected by communication, uh, cultural assumptions that we aren't even necessarily aware of. So what I do is I help uh, guide my clients through a three-step process, through understanding awareness, developing a roadmap to success, and then following those steps. And I've had pleasures to work with uh, doing presentations for in incubators for newcomer entrepreneurs, such as uh, in the Toronto Business Development uh, Center and other groups. So it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. And hopefully I can uh, lend some insights along with uh, great other people here like Clark as well. Looking forward. We're to so happy to have you here. Uh, and, you know, you mentioned a roadmap and the goal today is to be create a roadmap of sorts for people joining us and those who will be watching us later uh, to get a sense of, you know, what, job search in Canada looks like and what are some of the best practices and do, do's and don'ts uh, to know that will help them succeed. So let's begin with, you know, job search. Where can one search for jobs? There are, of course, so many uh, job sites, but when someone is new to Canada, there are so many platforms which are unknown to them. And even if you hear about them, there's this whole idea of finding jobs that may not be suitable for them or for their profession, and also so many fake postings there. So let's begin with, you know, some of the top sites that you would recommend and um, something that is trusted for you and your clients have had success with. 
Vlad, would you want to take this first? I'll, I'll start, and I'm sure John will, will, will jump in here with his insight as well. Um, in terms of safe job sites and, and what, where you can start, uh, it would be a site like Indeed. Uh, Indeed's a great, it, it's a, it, it amalgamates all the different job boards and all the different job sites into pulling all, all postings together. So in terms of safe spaces, uh, Indeed is a great resource um, to see just what's available out there within your region and what is being publicly posted. Uh, it, it, it's a fantastic spot. Uh, the other area would be LinkedIn. It would be a, a quite a safe space as well. Um, most companies now are, are posting their jobs on, on LinkedIn. In fact, a lot of companies now are using LinkedIn exclusively, not only to post jobs, but to also uh, have applicants apply directly through LinkedIn. And what's nice about using that profile for the viewers here who may not be using LinkedIn is that they can connect with people who work within that organization. They can connect with whether it's the hiring manager, the HR person, or just somebody who works in that organization and see if that organization and job might be a right fit for them. Uh, as something we can probably talk about a bit later here, structuring a bit of an informal interview with somebody within that organization to, to get a sense as to you know, what the role's like, what the organization right, see if it's a fit and see maybe what they need to do to get a foot in the door with that organization. So. LinkedIn's a great place for job postings. LinkedIn's also a great place for making connections for jobs that may not be posted, but in organizations that you may want to work for as well. So, uh, you know, LinkedIn's really my favorite place uh, where I, I'd be working with clients on, uh, but indeed as well for that formal job posting process. Yeah. In my opinion, I've always found LinkedIn to be slightly more user friendly in terms of it's not as overwhelming as, say, another job site where, you know, you get a barrage of uh, postings all together and then can be a bit much. Uh, John, your thoughts on that? And I'd like to add to the question about also being able to identify, you know, in that huge, uh, in so many posts that you see on these platforms, how can one also identify some which might just be fake? So as you mentioned a few platforms uh, of your choice and trusted ones, if you could also tell us a little bit about, you know, how to spot a fake job posting. Right. Well, in terms of the platforms that I, I support, I'm I'm a huge fan of LinkedIn in, in because of all the reasons that Clark's already mentioned and because of that in particular that, that you can connect with anyone. And I think that that is something that is so powerful. And with that, uh, one thing that comes with that is, is that to take full advantage of that is necessary to have that confidence mm -hmm. to connect with people and reach out to them. And I think perhaps depending on circumstances, a personality, maybe feeling a bit shy about it. Oh, oh, I don't, I don't want to bother this person because they might, uh, you know, might not make a good impression or things like that. I think as long as you take the right approach you are reaching out to people, not necessarily asking for a job, which might seem a bit counterintuitive, at least initially, but the idea of asking for information, as Clark even mentioned, the idea that you can find out more about the about the the job, about the company, and, and is this a particular place that would be a good fit for you? And that's really, it's really just getting that mindset, that yeah. understanding of, what you can do with with that uh and that's also a bit of the a bit of the cultural aspect as well because people are that's the thing most canadians are quite open to being uh reached out to as long as you're doing it in a, in a way that's understanding do you have 20 minutes 30 minutes uh, please feel free i'm sure we'll get more into that as we talk more about networking in terms of fake job postings i'm sure clark may have more specific information on that but i would say obviously the idea of anything that seems a bit too good to be true and particularly uh anything i would say anything with any sort of guarantees say guaranteed you know any kind of job oh well, guaranteed to uh get things where it seems like they're more trying to sell to you in a sense you know, where they're really trying to appeal to you yeah you really need to apply to this I would say in general, just what consider what is it that they're they're looking for? What why why is it that they're so eager to to get whoever they can to apply? Yeah. 
just using some, you know, using a bit of critical thinking, um, avoiding and, and avoiding that sense of desperation that you might be coming in, depending on your situation, step back and yep. maybe get some feedback from others. You know, what, what do you think about this, this job offer from people that you trust as well? So that's what I would have to say about, about the fake job postings. But what would you I think would about, think- and Clark, feel free mm-hmm. to kind of jump in here. Yeah. Uh, but what would you say about, you know, some posts, of course, employers would ask for your details, but some posts uh, go on to ask like personal details. And uh, mm-hmm. with this question, Clark, if you were to answer this, I would also like for you to, you know, touch upon some of the elements that kind of explain the Canadian culture and job search realm that here, as opposed to some other cultures or countries, a lot of personal details are not really expected on your LinkedIn profile or on your resume. Uh, and similarly, they would not be really listed in the job posts as well. Um, Karen, would you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so in, in, in terms of the, the Canadian job market and job postings, they're, they're, they're very formal. Um, what you'll see is a very formal job-specific related posting. Here's, here's what the job's about. Here's the skills and experiences, the education that we're looking for. Um, And those are the things that uh, on your resume or your application, that employer is looking for you to address and make sure you're covering off those those key items within your application. Getting into too much personal detail about uh, other things isn't necessary at that stage. You can make that connection when you, you, you get to an interview or you start getting to know the hiring manager, the recruiter. But at that, at that early stage, it's very, very professional. Cover letters, resumes are still important things to have in your, in your application process. And really just when you're applying to, to systems online, whether it's either attaching that cover letter or resume or copying and pasting what you have in those documents within to the application system, it, it, that's how it translates there. You don't need to get overly personal at that stage. That comes later in the process. I understand. Yeah. Uh, John, could you maybe talk a little bit about, you know, the aspect of, of course, uh, people will be expected to share some details, but at the same time, yes. sometimes, you know, uh, recruiters reach out with postings that don't even mention the name of the company. And as we know, there are lots of scams also that happen, uh, wherein resumes are collected or information is collected and interviews and jobs are promised. And then, you know, probably money is expected. Um, we, we wouldn't be going too much into detail uh, in this, but any thoughts on, you know, how can one be sure that if the company name is not listed in the posting that a recruiter is probably sharing with you, is it still safe to apply or is it okay to politely ask for the name? At what stage can one find out? I'm just kind of wondering. Yeah, well, I, I would generally say it's it really just to add on what what Clark had already said in terms of the the types of information that they're they're looking for um one thing that i always you know stressed about when giving advice on on resumes because i for some time gave uh feedback on not necessarily newcomers but just people in general who had been laid off uh to update their resumes and and it would even not necessarily indicate things like street address let alone things such as obviously family details needing to include a photo. Um, that other kind of information is generally uh, not not included. And in terms of the well, in terms of whether or not it's safe to determine, I would I would say just consider what kind of information they would they're really asking for. And as Clark had stressed, it's really a lot of early information, a lot of this information isn't needed in early stages. The only time they need your street address is, of course, when they're knowing, okay, well, what, what address do we need for putting together your, you know, the, the contract and, yes. and uh, payment information and things like that. So asking for things like bank details, all of that. Mm-hmm. So Clark, you may have more to add yeah, in would, terms of I, fake. You know, great, all great points by John there. And one of the things that's you know, great in the day and age of internet and especially LinkedIn is that if if someone's approaching you and it's a recruiter that's approaching you and they're not willing to give the the name of the company that's hired them to to do their search, um, you know, that's a bit of a red flag that would 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 come okay. up with me. And that may be a little too good to be true. Uh, but the other thing is is with LinkedIn, 
you can you can search up who that recruiter is and based on their pro one if they're if they're a professional recruiter they will have a linkedin profile if they don't that's a big red flag for you mm-hmm. um and then based on their linkedin profile do a bit of research as to are they working for a legitimate recruitment firm what types of jobs do they recruit for that at that recruitment firm and it's that background research that will give you some pretty good indication i would think about is this legitimate? Is this too good to be true? And is this something that I, I need to, you know, further and, and, and explore a bit more? Or do I just walk away from and, and leave it alone? Yeah. Now, there's a question that I see here, and it's kind of related to, you know, something that I just wanted to bring next uh, is a little bit about the mindset of job search. Uh, as a newcomer, someone who's fresh in the country is still trying to understand the culture here, still trying to understand how the employment market works and is applying to say hundreds of jobs in a day or a week, um, it's, it's possible that you know for weeks at a stretch, you may not really either get a response or not get a positive response. And the question here is related to that. Mohammed is asking us that I applied for more than 100 jobs and nothing happened. I'm in marketing and have more than six years of experience. What should I do? Uh, could either of you, you know, begin with a little bit about the mindset that is required in Canada for job search and how can one handle rejection and still keep moving forward? Sure. I don't mind jumping in and John, feel free to interrupt at any time sure. here. But, uh, you know, in, in terms of in terms of mindset, it's it's not necessarily quantity uh, in terms of how many jobs you're, you're applying for. It's, it's about about quality. And I think in in terms of new immigrants and, and people new to the Canadian job market, it's helping employers uh, make the connection between your experience that you have outside of Canada and how it relates to the experience that employers are looking for inside of Canada. And sometimes it doesn't translate really well. And so, you know, what I advise clients to do in those cases is making sure that if there there's certain skills that an employer is looking for, certain experience, certain uh, education, being really clear in your application and your cover letter and whatever your communication is with those uh, employers that you're applying to, that it, it, you know this this equals this. So what you're looking for here is the same as what I have here, and here's how. And be, being really clear with that. The other point, you know, John and I have talked about this is not just applying, is reaching out and making those direct connections, and that is what helps sell yourself much further than just putting in an application, putting in a resume, applying online and hoping for the phone ringer, hoping that you're going to get an email. It's taking it that I was just working with a client who was applying to a a big Canadian, uh, uh, let's just call it yoga apparel company and, uh, and, and applying for their head office position there. And they applied, but then they took it a step further and they reached out again by LinkedIn to five employees that worked within that organization and said, would love to, do you mind connecting with me? And all five said, sure, no problem. They all connected. Canadians are nice, usually pretty friendly people. And so they all connected. And then she took it a step further and said, I'm really interested in working in your organization. Would you have five minutes for just a quick informal interview so I can learn a little bit, of, a little bit more about the organization, about the types of roles you have there? All five people gave her the time of day. All five people said, yep, no problem. We'll take five minutes. And those connections then helped connect her to a job, which helped connect her to to, to a role within that organization. And she was successful in in an eventual application process. So it's just, it's that mindset is, it's just a bit about having a little bit of confidence, a little bit of faith. And at the end of the day, when you're, when you're putting, when you're asking somebody for a connection, the worst thing, and I tell clients this all the time, the worst thing they're going to say is nothing or no, thank you. I'm not interested in connecting with you. That is the worst thing. Okay, no big deal. You can move on and, and find somebody else, but you'll be surprised at how many people will really give you the time and spend a little bit of time with you. And those connections are absolutely golden in, in your job search uh, efforts. Yeah. Wonderfully said. said. Yeah. Yeah. I, I completely agree with what, uh, with Clark, what Clark mentioned there. And really, it is first of all, addressing that mindset, I, I think, and this was something that I had to adjust to in terms of just 
reaching out, connecting to people, which I'm, I'm, I, as I said, I'm a big fan of LinkedIn, but that was something that was really recently because I had a different mindset previously of thinking about connecting with people and networking as being kind of a, uh, a negative thing and, and, and that fear of rejection. Okay. What will happen? And then changing it to more of a situation of, okay, let's see how many people can reject me today. Because because the point is to get out there and just go and do it. And you, okay, so what? So they're as Clark said. So what if they reject me? You know that's that's fine. And you know you get those you do get those victories where you get to make um, a, a connection in term. And I'm I'm talking in terms of I, I am focusing on the networking side of things because it's when you're applying for jobs. If you're only doing it through the traditional means, yes, you're going to get those rejections. That's normal. Uh, so go out and connect with people in the company. Get them to know who you are as a person. I would say a, a great way to do that is people who you have an interest in, whether they are hiring managers, whether they are other people, follow them and then comment on them. So comment on any content that they're putting up. Follow up by by asking a connection request. Hey, I really love what you say because then you're showing that you have an interest in them as a person, as opposed to can you? Oh, please, can you take a look at my resume? Um, I'm, I'm looking for that because that almost never never works if you're doing it just from that sense. And then building that connection. And the thing is, is that you never know who could connect you to a job opportunity. I run weekly LinkedIn live uh, shows, Intercultural Insiders. And I have some uh, recordings with some uh, live chat as well. And in fact, there was there were two people who connected in there. Uh, one woman who's been in Canada for several months and was just going through all these rejections, couldn't seem to get a job, highly skilled project manager, connected with someone else in there who happened to connect her to a recruiter who got her to an interview and I just heard from the other day that she's got a job offer. And this was within the span of a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, another situation where there was uh, someone who'd come from Japan, had been highly skilled, looking for jobs for a couple of years, was defeated, found a job because of mommy friends. They both had children. <laughs> and this person ended up being their mentor and now they're working in an organization that's helping newcomers to to find work so you never know who's going to connect with you if you go outside of that sort of traditional what you might be expected in your in your home country where it's oh it's all it's only the jobs that are posted um you just apply there and wait take an active role go out see how often you can get rejected try to try to build up that that list and uh you know you you build up that fear the road to success is paved with failure. So if you think of those as little failures, you're going to get onto that success. You'll get past that fear, which is just uh, the only use that fear has is protecting you from when you're about to be eaten by a tiger. Uh, <laughs> it's not so good <laughs> when, uh, you know, fearing of rejection, that social rejection, what's the worst that can happen? You're not going to to die from that, right? So, so true. So true. Yeah. Mohammed, we hope that, you know, these uh, tips uh, would help you. And, uh, you know, I, I've been hearing two words, which are like the buzzwords here very often. And I'm sure that this is something that a lot of newcomers in their new Canadian journey will be hearing over and over again. And those two words are LinkedIn and networking. So let's spend a couple of minutes now uh, focusing on and connecting these two. LinkedIn is, of course, a platform that cannot be ignored when it comes to a job search or just professional presence in Canada and across the globe. And uh, at the same time, you know, the whole idea of networking is huge, too, in Canada. Uh, Clark, would you want to kind of build a connection between these and share a little bit about any tips that you have for uh, effective networking when it comes to job search as a new immigrant? Yeah, I, I think it. Uh, John really said it there, and he, he he had a key point where he said it's not about connecting with somebody saying, "Hey, would you look at my resume? Hey, I, I want to work for your company. What can you do for me?" It's about it's, it's about make more of an organic connection and and showing interest in in the individual, showing interest in the organization, and 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 allowing a relationship ship to grow. And I think that's an important thing because. You know, for for us, I know John is probably the same as as me. Once you got 
once I got in the mindset of being able to put myself out there, allow myself to connect, allow myself to be okay if there's rejection, so many more doors open for me. But it wasn't me pushing an agenda. It was me just inquiring with people and have and, and opening myself up just to, to say, let's have a conversation. Let's meet. Let's just talk. What's it like to be in your organization? What kind of jobs are there? What, are, what opportunities do, uh, do, do you have? Um, you know, anyone else you think I can talk to just about working within this industry and, and trying to draw connections that way. And like I said earlier, it's, it's incredible what time people will give you to have those, to have those conversations and, and, and make those connections. And, and just, I, I say, it's kind of getting out of your skin, making yourself a little bit vulnerable and, and just being able to connect with people. LinkedIn makes it really easy. I would also just say some of the obvious things or maybe not so obvious things, which is if you're building your LinkedIn profile, um, you know, look at other people's profiles that are attractive. And there's lots of examples, there's lots, certainly lots of information on, on, on the web, on the web about building LinkedIn profiles. But if you're going to use a picture, make sure it's it's a it's a it's a professional type picture. It's not just you kind of taking a selfie and and uh, and hoping for the best. You can put a banner on on top of your uh, your page, uh, being clear as to you know some of your headlines, the things that you want to draw people's attention to about yourself uh, in your about sections. Uh, you know, it's a bit of a, a mini resume or what you're all about. And of course, below that you have your experience section where you can get into your experience and education. And then once you have that created, you start making those connections. You start, the other piece I would say is start commenting, start providing content, follow people, look at what they're posting, make comment back about what they're posting, whether you agree or disagree, or you have something more to add to the conversation. It's all really powerful stuff. And again, that that's what starts the networking. It's all those little things. And it's like John said, you're not going to get it right from the beginning. There'll be little mistakes yeah. you make all along the way. Little little failures, but I love how he said it. It's little failures, which are little steps. And those little steps equal progress. And that progress, before you know it, is a mile uh, versus just saying, you know what, I don't know, what, I don't know how to do this. I don't want to do it. I'm not, I'm just going to kind of keep doing what I'm doing and ending up with the same results. You'll go through, uh, you, you'll start going down this journey. You'll be surprised at how far you get and how many great people you connect with. So correct. Yeah. And uh, just for those people among the attendees today who are stuck at that stage of perfecting their LinkedIn profile, I'd like to tell you, uh, we've done some cafe sessions on that. And on our YouTube channel, on New Canadians YouTube channel, you would find resources and full sessions which talk about how to build your profile and how to perfect that. So if that is something that interests you or that is where you're stuck, please do uh, check that out. Um, John, I would also want to ask you a little bit about the communication aspect, you know, as an intercultural coach, you would understand uh, people coming from different cultures from across the globe have different ways of communicating. Uh, and it's okay in some cultures to be very active and to just reach out or some cultures probably uh, have a way of, you know, addressing people as certain ma'am. Um, on LinkedIn and with the context of uh, Canadian culture, would you be able to share, say, your top three tips when someone is reaching out for a networking request on LinkedIn? Uh, what are some of the do's and don'ts that you would want to highlight here? Okay, well, yeah, that's a great question. I would say, first of all, since you, you mentioned it, Shruti, uh, how you address the person. Uh, avoid sir or ma'am. Uh, the, the reason is is that in, in Canada, we like we have this idea of being being quite uh, quite approachable and friendly. We want to we want to create that sort of atmosphere, and part of that is by addressing each other by first names, right? So being comfortable with that. If you if you use sir, ma'am, it, it, it if the person is born or raised in Canada, that might to them feel like oh that's that's rather cold and rather formal, and that's not necessarily a, a good way to to start the communication in that sense. Uh, I would say uh, also uh, being a bit careful about how direct you're being, uh, mm -hmm. because that's one other thing where we, you know, want to have a friendly atmosphere, and, and sometimes it's being maybe well, depending on the culture you're from, it might might you you might consider it being very indirect, or if you're from somewhere like uh, Japan, that might seem very direct to you because it, it, it's all a continuum. So what I mean in that sense is. You know, when you are making a request, uh, for example, to to have an, to have a conversation after you've already connected with them, 
Um, well, first of all, I would say, getting ahead of myself, once you've sent that connection request, and I would recommend doing that after you have, for example, commented on their uh, content, uh, I would say, you know, uh, hey, you know, we love that. If, if, if you're open to it, I think it would be great to connect. Um, being direct, being very direct, like saying, hey, let's connect. Um, it might work with some people, but it might also seem a bit strong. So just, you know, if, if you're open to it, it would be great to connect. That's a nice kind of sort of friendly way without being too strong about it. And then when you follow up, I would recommend when you can try to get that into whether it's a Zoom conversation or uh, a coffee conversation, the sooner that you can get into an actual conversation as opposed to just sending messages back and forth, yep. the better. And I would recommend by doing that saying, hey, just as we've already talked about, you know, I'd love to get some information about this. Do you have, if you've got 20, 30 minutes um, in the next couple of weeks, it'd be great to talk about that. How does that sound to you? So again, it's, it's very polite, but friendly. Uh, so those would be some of the, the main tips I would suggest with connecting with that. Um, so don't, yeah, don't be too formal. Don't be too direct. Yeah. Don't say, please look at my, please look at my resume. Don't, don't, avoid the ask. Mm -hmm. If it's anything outside of information, uh, yeah, it, you know, please, please help me. If you're, if it seems a bit too desperate, then that can also be a turn off as well because they're expecting, well, okay, what else are they going to be asking me for? Um, even if you're feeling it outside, feeling it on the inside, just channel that friendliness, channel that what you've learned about Canadian politeness. So remember, okay, being nice, being nice. We like to be nice here, which may seem weird, but that's, yeah, I think that will help you uh, in, in connecting and, you know, getting that, that opportunity to build the relationship. So yeah. that's what I, would I say. like how you describe that. Uh, Clark, I saw you nodding. So is there anything you'd like to add to what uh, John just said before we kind of move from networking into, you know, resumes and other um, things related to job search? Yeah, I think I think John really, really covered it off there. And, and it's just it, it is making that more of yeah, it's not that direct connection where where you're you're asking for something. You're 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 trying to develop a relationship. And I think that's the approach coming in. The great thing, of course, with LinkedIn is you do it, you can do it online. And the great thing is, is like John said, try and get a meeting where you can you can meet with them. But Zoom is such, or Zoom or Teams or whatever your platform is such a, a more informal, less um, kind of anxious environment where you've got to meet someone directly face to face for coffee. You know, you can do it from the comfort of your own home, which also puts the person on the other end. You're trying to make that connection with a little bit more at ease as well. Like, sure, I can I can spend a few minutes with you on this on this Zoom meeting and answer your question. So it's it, it it's a great opportunity to do that. And something, I mean, I know we would be moving to the other section soon, but uh, something that kind of just comes to mind is we've talked a little bit about LinkedIn and in-person and uh, online networking, but there's also something that, you know, I think all of these practices through these platforms would also help someone at a job fair. Uh, is there anything that is different when it comes to a job fair and networking at a job fair or interacting with someone at a job fair? Or do you think all of these uh, tips that both of you shared uh, apply and would suffice? I think, yeah, sorry, go ahead, John. No, I, I, I think that, in my opinion, I think a lot of these tips would be applicable as well. Um, perhaps uh, you might spend a little more time being open to, uh, well, I would say when you're getting into that, into that case, of course, you're going to be getting into the meeting. Yeah. One thing definitely to be prepared for is to have some small talk. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is something that, which okay so what's the reason for that well the reason as i mentioned as canadians we 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 like to have that friendly atmosphere but we also tend to separate the our personal lives from our professional lives mm -hmm. which means that we you know we have that friendly surface but we're not necessarily going to get into a lot of very personal details about our our families for example or health things like that right away so this is why you will hear canadians talking about Let's talk about the weather. Oh, the weather. How is that? How is that today? Or how how is the traffic? Oh, traffic. Yeah, traffic was terrible down here. And um, oh yeah, did you see the game last night? You know, a lot of kind of innocuous 
unimportant topics, but that is the way that we keep that friendly atmosphere. Uh, so it's it although it seems kind of unusual, yes, it's 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 a great way to to start. And if you, if you're approaching somebody, I mean, of course, in a networking event, you could just say hi, hi, um, yeah. you know, it's nice uh, nice to meet you. I'm John, but you could also perhaps use the opportunity to comment on something on the uh, in the in the situation you're in. I, I was just at that event earlier today and started a conversation with someone there because of the the food table, and I, I had I had mistaken. Um, pierogies for I, I thought they were empanadas right and so I saw that oh yeah I had to come over here because the, the empanadas oh yeah me too and I use that as an opportunity to start a conversation so um yeah now you don't necessarily want to spend obviously the entire time doing that a couple of minutes to warm up introduce yourself so I, I would just add that in in terms of uh in terms of the conversation as well anything to add to that Clark or yeah, and I, I think it's also being prepared for small talk. So it's looking mm -hmm. for those openings like John talked about, the empanadas or the pierogies, and you know, looking for that opening to talk, whether it's weather or sports or, or or whatever. But at some point that conversation may turn into more of, you know, hey, tell me a little bit about yourself. And I think you need to be prepared to talk about yourself from uh, the personal side of things, you know, what, what your background is, where you're from. Um, that that all creates great conversation. But also on the professional side of things as well, and there's a there's a term where we talk about the elevator pitch, right? So are you able to have that thirty second conversation and give somebody a, a brief summary about who you are and what you're all about? And you know, so prior to going to those events, it's good for you to either practice or at least have in your own mind if someone asks you those questions. What are you going to say and be prepared to, especially at a job fair where you may be meeting with a, a, a potential employer or a recruiter who says, oh, tell me about your work background. What, 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 what are you all about? And knowing what you want to say is really important versus trying to think on the spot about what you want to say about yourself and fumbling through your response by going to going to an event like that. You also are, are ready and prepared to speak about yourself is really important. The same rules apply as if you're on LinkedIn or a Zoom call with somebody making those first connections, you have to be prepared to talk about yourself. Yeah. yeah. And if I can just jump sure. in, sorry, to add in a little point there, everything that, that Clark said was great. The elevator pitch is very important. I would also say, be prepared to, um, another thing maybe applicable to Canada and, and, and the US as well, is to balance that conversation. Because uh, I know in, in in some cultures, it's quite common to, to give lots of detail and keep going and going and going. And particularly if you're in a situation where you may be rather nervous, there's maybe a tendency to continue on with that. Um, but uh, it's, it's important to if you do that, that could end up coming across as, as, you know, you're a person who dominates the conversation, doesn't allow the other person to talk, and that could create a, a, an unfavorable impression. So I would suggest when you can, make sure to make sure to ask questions to the other person to show that you're interested in them. Oh, okay. So, uh, you know, there, there, there are a number of, uh, you know, you can, and, and that makes it easier for you because you don't have to do as much talking as well. People love to talk about themselves. You love to talk about yourself. You know, the other person loves to talk about themselves too. Ask them. Yeah. So, you know, what do you, and it can be, you know, so what's your, what's your next step? You know, if they, they tell you some projects, interesting projects or something that's going on. And I think that can help to, to show, that you're not a person, not giving the impression that you're a person who wants to just dominate the conversation and just talk about yourself. Yes, do have those uh, self-introductions ready, but be prepared to balance it out and give the other person opportunities to speak to, so. Something that you know the two of you mentioned is elevator pitch. So here's a little bit of a challenge. An elevator pitch is something that you know people would get about say 30 seconds at max to be able to talk about themselves. So in say 30 seconds, what are your top tips uh, about perfecting an elevator pitch, Clark. Yeah, so I would say 30 seconds may be tough, but what I would say the areas you want to focus on on your elevator pitch from your from your background are things that you've been involved in. So your education, training, that kind of thing. The, the top areas, not all of it, the top pieces of that. That's what you want to talk about. Your work experience, again, the top pieces that relate to whatever the job or industry is you're applying for. People forget about other areas, though, as well, which are things like volunteer work, 
-hmm. very important. A lot of people have volunteer work. They, they, they tend to not talk about that. That's really, really important if you do have the volunteer side of things. And then life accomplishments, things that you're really proud of in your life, whether it's awards and commendations that you may have received, whether it's, you know, different activities that you do outside of work, um, all of that type of stuff. You, you want to have a couple key points of all four of those areas to form a really nice elevator pitch. And I don't know if I did that in 30 seconds, but no. <laughs> close <laughs> enough, I believe. I wasn't really checking the time. So you, you did good. But something else that, you know, I mean, I mentioned earlier resumes, of course, and there's a long list of points that I would like to cover today. But um, Clark, again to you, what would be some of your top do's and don'ts, you know, maybe two do's and two don'ts or something that definitely one needs to know in Canada when it comes to resumes and cover letters. Uh, yeah. Of course, we have, like I mentioned, we've done some sessions on, and I'm sure on both of your platforms, there are lots of such uh, resources as well that people could access, but some top tips that you'd like to share with us today. Yeah, so in the do category on, on, on the resume, I think it's important for people to understand it's it's all about your first page of your resume is the most important page of your resume. I call it, I use the term, it's your top uh, piece of real estate. So as a recruiter or a hiring manager, that's the very first thing I'm going to look at. So it's the most important piece. So I'm not, look, I typically don't look at your cover letter and I don't start looking at page two or three or however many pages you have. I'm looking at that first page. So do focus on content that you want to build in that first page and do focus on the content that's most relevant to the job. And so a couple of things are, uh, you know, if a, if, if a job is uh, more heavy on, you know, experience and work experience, that first page needs to really talk about your work experience as it relates to the job you're applying for. If it's more education, you're just getting into the workforce out of school, education is going to be important on that first page. Also, you're going to want a skills section where you can talk about key skills that you have on job posting. It always lists those key skills. Uh, whether it's leadership or computer skills or accounting skills, whatever those things are, and have that built into a key sec, a key skill section for two reasons. One, so the hiring manager can look to see whether it aligns with those with with the skills they're looking for. But also, if you're applying online and they your resume goes through or your application goes through a robot, and that robot does all the the sorting for the the hiring manager, the robot's picking up on keywords. As it's look as it's been programmed to look for keywords based on what the job yep. posting is asking for, and get that in front of an actual human, which is the hiring manager. So those those two sections are really important in terms of don't the one big don't. And I'll turn over to to John here, but the one big don't for me is length of resume. So don't create a resume that reads like a novel, uh, is heavy heavy text based, and is really more than I don't build resumes more than three pages. And so trying to keep it in that range, I actually try and build resumes at that two page mark. Mm -hmm. uh, so anything longer than two to three pages, you're not going to get the, the type of traction and type of review that you think you're going to get with your resume. Yeah. Yeah. John, anything yeah. that you'd like to add for resumes, but you know, I'd probably sure. add to the cover letter as well. If there's something specifically, because a cover letter is where beyond the resume, you're able to talk a little bit about yourself. Uh, and yes. showcase your personality. So we'd like to keep it brief here, but announce that quickly. Yeah, well, well, I completely agree again with what Clark had said, uh, particularly about length of resume. Mm -hmm. uh, things that I would say definitely do to add on top of that, uh, I would say when you're describing your, your previous positions, your previous jobs, whether it's volunteer experience or whatever, write them out as actions. What things did you actually do? Right. Avoid avoid things like responsible for this. Now use use action if it's if it's a current position, you know, using an ING form, uh, uh, you know, uh, supervising for quality control, uh, doing things things like that, and, and you know, uh, helped helped uh, clients to to organize their finances, whatever it is. But it's it rather than just saying like a list pull up points of oh. Uh, uh, you know, account management or something like that to show, show some activeness. And I, and I would say that when you're also introducing yourself as well, going just briefly touching back on that, rather yeah. than just saying, I'm this, this, what, how I introduced myself, I help, I help newcomers and, uh, and I help newcomers and expats connect across cultures, <laughs> kind of forgot it for a second, but, that, <laughs> but it shows that activeness as well. Um, yes. other things to avoid, don't well definitely include volunteer experience um 
if it's relevant to the job and, and, but don't put it in, if it's going to take you over that two page limit and I kind of go like maximum two page limit, then you might want to leave that out if you have more relevant experience. So that's what I would say about that. Um, but a cover letter, would, would there so be something cover that stands out? Yeah. Yeah. Well, a cover letter you can get into specifically detailing what it is that you're interested in, particularly with the, with the, the position that you're applying for, for the, for the company that you're applying for, I would say, whereas the resume is more just talking a history of your experiences, you know, you can talk about what it is you're looking for, what it is that you're hoping to accomplish in the organization that you're applying for. And obviously, since the cover letter is more specific to the situation, I would say, um, that's where you might be a, maybe slightly more formal in, in the writing, but, uh, you know, sir or madam kind of avoid, avoid those terms because uh, those are, especially nowadays with terms about gender identity and so on, yes. using terms like that can be quite loaded and you might get the opposite effect. If you have the person's name, it's probably better to use that and, and avoid using Mr. or Mrs. or any gender specific terminology, just because it, it could cause problems that you don't necessarily even intend. Um, so that's what I would say about, about cover letters. Yeah. You know, you mentioned gender and uh, something that comes to mind, and I haven't really seen it on a resume. Are, uh, are pronouns something that one should share on a resume or a cover letter? I've seen that on LinkedIn. I see people sharing that, but I haven't really come across uh, people sharing their pronouns on uh, resumes or cover letters. Or Clark, in your experience, have you probably seen some or would it be a good idea? It's personal choice. I think mm -hmm. you know, in terms of in terms of how people want to present themselves, it's it's absolutely personal choice. I don't think it's a it, it's it's a negative at all. Um, it, it it's up to you. I don't see it often. Of course, on LinkedIn, you see, you see it there. Yes. But if if someone's personal choice is to add their pronouns, then then add, add their pronouns. I don't think it takes away from from their application at all. Sure. That was just like a personal question. It just came to mind. So, <laughs> but something I wanted to do, staying on the topic of uh, resumes and cover letters, are there any resources besides, of course, I shared that, you know, your websites and your um, uh, businesses have resources, but is there anything specifically that comes to mind uh, that you would like to share? Because Romeo here is asking us a question about any resources that you would want to recommend for writing an effective cover letter. Um, maybe if you have something that you'd like to share with us, we can share it with our audience after the webinar in our communication with them. Um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I, all I was going to say on, on resumes, there, there are a lot of resources online, a lot of tools for resume builders, a lot of websites offer uh, support on building resumes, even as basic as Word, opening up Word and having resume templates. I think I call it the, the the flow and content of your resume is so important in capturing the reader's attention. So it's the flow being what your eyes are drawn to on the resume and then the content within what your eyes are drawn to. So trying to create a resume from scratch is really, really challenging. Trying to create that content from scratch is also very challenging. And there are professional resume writers that get paid a lot of money to write resumes. So use the resources that are out there that can build those templates for you, whether it's the free stuff on Word or whether it's some of these organizations. I mean, I, I do resume writing. I'm not sure if John does as well, but it's, it, you know, use those resources to your advantage because it, it, they're built in a way that, att that are, attract a reader's eyes to certain parts of your resume and it makes your life a whole lot easier. So you're not trying to create it and do all that formatting and resume writing is a bit of a, it, it's quite a specialty. And it can be quite <laughs> painful for, for people who aren't used yeah. to it, for sure. Another question yeah. here uh, is about, you know, if you would want to recommend any organizations or resources that can help one find jobs, because someone here is sharing that, you know, they've had uh, no luck with really uh, job search when it comes to, uh, they've done a lot of networking on LinkedIn as well, and have a PhD in computer science and a part-time, um, currently work in a college as a part-time faculty. But is there an organization or any association that you know you would recommend when it comes to networking or finding a job? Yeah, in terms of uh, in terms of different organizations, when I'm thinking about Toronto, there are a number of organizations out there that can help with that, uh, such as Access, uh, Tino, the Neighborhood Organization, 
uh, TRIAC, Toronto Regional and Grand Employment Council, uh, so many other organizations that are out there that that I would recommend that are that are well known, have good reputations and have a lot of uh, not only opportunities to find jobs, but opportunities to connect with mentors and others that can support, give you access. And because many of these are funded by governments they can of course you know many of the, the the resources are paid for there so it's so they they can be free yeah. to access as well i would say that those are and and many of them have events for networking as well whether it's speed mentoring events or or opportunities to connect with uh, mentors events to hear it's it's really worth looking into those for sure and something thank you for that something i'd like to just add here is you know the ones that you mentioned are in toronto but outside of toronto and the gta in other parts of canada as well if you're unable to kind of pinpoint organizations you could always do a search for settlement and employment organizations in your area and in your province and reach out to them either uh, through virtual chat or you know show up at their office if they're uh, functioning in person right now and there will be employment counselors who might be able to and career coaches who will be able to help you with um, these as well i would just add to that shruti that linkedin is great for groups yes. so there's lots of groups within different industries or different uh, career backgrounds so if it's computers that the individual the computer science but that individual's background is from you can look for groups within your area and they they may exist on linkedin where it connects like-minded people together and again, that's another great resource to, to start connecting with people. Another question here, uh, and I'm just kind of taking questions from the audience right now, uh, takes us in a different direction. Uh, this question from Brent is about, you know, what advice do the panelists have for newcomers about applying to smaller organizations or jobs in smaller communities, which might not be on their radar? When one is applying to lots of jobs and probably, you know, everyone thinks of like the top companies, the names and the brands that they've heard of and often don't even consider the smaller businesses um, that are offering and have vacancies and are looking for people. And especially at a time when, you know, there's labor shortage uh, and everyone's struggling with and retaining uh, workers. What are some of the tips that you have or advice when it comes to applying to smaller organizations or smaller communities? Well, I would say to, of course, apply to those organizations, the smaller companies and so on, you obviously need to know a bit more about them. And on top of, of networking, we've talked about networking through LinkedIn or going to specifically networking organizations. I would say another place to, to even start, uh, not, on, not only to find out about what these organizations are offering, uh, but also to just get build up your confidence to talking with people is... Mm -hmm. Talk to people in where you live, in your neighborhood. Where do you go? You know, you go for for coffee. And this was also some recommendations I've, I've heard also from a number of newcomers who've been here for quite some time and been successful as well. You're waiting in line for for coffee. Talk to talk to the person that you see there every day who you're buying coffee from. Talk to the other people who are in line with you. Hey, hey, what are you getting today? You know, oh, I'm getting a double double and so on. And it, it's it's all about building to find out about these different organizations it's about building those relationships because again those smaller organizations uh they uh, there may be some local local uh job boards or things where you can find out about those but um hearing about them from other people who you're connected to in the local area i think is a, is a, a great way to start um on multiple levels and as well as building your confidence and talking to strangers and then after you're doing that so much doing things like the elevator pitch as we discussed in networking events is maybe not as scary as well so and I, I would also add that. I would also add to that is that you never know what doors are going to open and I know early on in my career there were certain things I, I was in in my mind I was only going to apply to certain companies because they're the big, sexy company that, you know, had all these wonderful things said about them. And once I got that out of my head and was more open to other opportunities, I accepted one of those other opportunities, but that opportunity led to a whole bunch of different doors and different pathways that may not have existed had I not gone through the door, meaning that smaller organization with that opportunity. And so I think it, it's important for newcomers or anybody to not limit themselves to just big, large organizations. Those smaller ones can provide a lot of experience. They can provide a ton of 
um, broad experience as well, because you're typically doing a whole lot. Whereas in large organizations, you, you may be uh, focused on a very narrow uh, path. And in the smaller ones, you've got much more exposure and you gain a, a lot more experience, which either helps you grow within that organization or allows you to gain experience to go to the larger organization at some point. So really good opportunities and I wouldn't ever close the door on those. Yeah. You know, I'm looking at some of the things that I wanted to discuss with you today and uh, we've, we've pretty much uh, covered my list, but at the same time, I would want to check with you uh, with a few minutes left now, is there anything besides networking, LinkedIn, job search through resumes or, you know, um, volunteering that, you wanted to talk about, or if there are any last thoughts that you'd like to share, uh, John first, and then Clark, I'll come to you. I, I would say just to, from my end, to wrap things up, the whole idea to succeed, you have to do things that are uncomfortable for you. As we talk about the comfort zone and it, it's no situation is truer than, than, than it is now. You've taken the effort to, to come to Canada, to come to another another country, to, to find the opportunities here. We want you here. Canada needs you. We need those perspectives that you have, that you bring. Um, that's where all the innovation comes in and so on. And so don't be, don't let fear rule what you do to, to you know, be, be, be scared that you have to succeed, you know, uh, just I'm, I'm going to go for this job because it's safer, or I'm just mm -hmm. going to limit myself to talking to people in my community because I, I don't really understand the way things are, things are going out there. Take those opportunities, talk to, talk to strangers, talk to people you wouldn't normally talk to, mix with other communities. And, and I don't necessarily mean just, oh, talk to people who are born and raised in Canada. Connect with other communities as well. Canada is so diverse, especially in the larger cities. Uh, there's so much that you can learn from that. You'll have a better quality of life as well, just, just from connecting with other people alone. But I would say doing that um and then a lot of that uh, those these other things won't be as scary and you know and keeping that positive attitude not ignoring when negative things happen but having that positive attitude means that you are more aware of more opportunities because you're not stuck in oh i can't do this oh my life is terrible you start to see more and then there's so much that's possible when it comes yeah. to that I'll leave it so well put together. You know, you started with that component of like fear and then brought it back to that. So, and everything in between kind of ties together. Clark, anything that you'd like to add to the winning strategies that we've been discussing today for that yeah, job in, offer? In terms of that positive attitude, I, I think one of the things that I, I always advise people on is preparation equals confidence. Mm -hmm. and so the more you prepare in advance or in your job search journey, the better prepared you are, the more confidence you build as you go through each of those stages. So amazing. The people who are here today watching this, it's all part of your preparation. You're learning insight and hopefully you're picking up on little tips that you can use to tweak and, and, and build your application process and build your, your preparation for that eventual interview. So it's not waiting until you see the job to quickly build your resume and not waiting until that phone rings or that you get that email to quickly prepare for the interview. Your preparation is right now and you're starting that right now. So if you're, if for those of you who are out there just kind of fresh in your job search, you know, take the time, build that resume, take the time to start learning about the interview process and how to prepare for the interview process and how you might go about answering those questions, how to go about creating that 30 second elevator pitch and building and building really good speaking points. Because when you get to that interview and you get to that introduction through networking, whatever it is, then you're prepared to have that conversation. And I, I will say just a, a little tip, a very small tip, but works great. Use Zoom, use Teams, set up a meeting for yourself, hit the record button and mm -hmm. practice saying out loud some of those key things. So if you're going to a networking event and you've got that elevator pitch, and you, you, if someone asks you, tell me about yourself, practice saying that on camera. I know it's uncomfortable, but it's just you and the camera. And you can have you can see how you present some of the things that you say, and you can you can tweak your answers a little bit. You can see your your enthusiasm. You can see the way you look, and you can make subtle changes in the way you deliver that, so that when you go to those events, you're really really comfortable 
talking about yourself. You've heard yourself say it out loud. You've seen yourself say it. And it's just a great little practice tool between you and the computer that really helps build that confidence. So I'll just leave you with that little tip. But preparation equals confidence is is, is what it's all about. And start your preparation now and, and you, you'll have great success. That's amazing. Couldn't agree with you more there. And with that, we've come to the end of this session. Uh, thank you so much, Clark. Thank you so much, John. I hope that you know uh, our attendees have had uh, a really good time attending this session today and have learned so much. I, for one, have really enjoyed my conversation with the two of you. Uh, this was the session that was all about winning strategies to attract a Canadian job offer. Like this, we have lots of other sessions that we are planning for you. So please uh, do watch out. Um, and stay connected with us across our platforms. On your screen, you can see the details for the, uh, the businesses of our panelists. You can see my practice interview, which is uh, Clark's business, and he can. Uh, this is how you can reach out and connect with him. And also uh, John's, which is uh, Hiaku Coaching, and connect with him and learn more about his resources and all that he has to offer to you. This uh, session of Cafe New Canadians was brought to you by New Canadians TV Network. We have a newsletter for you. We have social media resources. Uh, on social media, we have a TV show on Omni and lots more. So please stay connected with us across all of these channels. If you want to learn from us about our sessions, our website, and across all of these platforms, you would be able to find all the details right there. And we can only hope that you will join us for another webinar the next time we have one. Thank you so much. Thanks to the panelists as well.